Good morning. We are glad to worship together this morning as we continue to explore this idea of what it means for the church to have left the building. As we settle into worship, I remind you that you are invited to gather a few things and you can pause now if you'd like to do that. Um, you can gather a candle if you would like to light one alongside us and also food and drink to receive for communion. So today as we begin to worship, we do so by lighting our candle, a reminder of God's presence with us always. And now our first act of worship together is to lift our voices in song as we sing the song, We Call Ourselves Disciples. Let us worship. Candle lighting is something we have often shared as an act of prayer. So as we begin our time of prayer, we light candles for those among us who are facing health issues, having surgeries, and healing from surgeries. For those who are struggling with job insecurity and financial hardship. for our nation and world as we continue to name racial injustice and move forward in a better way. Let us pray. Good morning, God. May we be reminded of and thankful for the beauty of your creation, the green of the earth, the warmth of the sun, the coolness of the breeze, the kindness of our friends. You are an awesome God, and we are grateful. Today, may we consider that we are creatures of habit. We tend to do the same things over and over, and while habits can be comforting, may we also recognize that sometimes our rituals, no matter how well-intentioned, lose their meaning. So we ask for your forgiveness in the ways that we are silent to the cries or numb to the pain of the world around us. And we ask that you grant us the insight to examine ourselves and move in ways that puts our faith to work in this world. God, today we lift in prayer to you all those who are anticipating or healing from surgeries, those with health issues, those who are struggling with job or financial insecurities, and for all as we continue to name racial injustice in our world. Help us to offer your comfort, your relief, and your justice 
to the world. Amen. Good morning, kids. I have a few things here for you to consider. So um, you might notice I'm wearing, wearing a hat. It kind of looks like a fishing hat. I have this nice fishing pole. Hey, look at that. I already have a fish. Well, you might wonder why I have this fishing stuff. And the reason that I have this fishing stuff is because Vacation Bible School started this week. And uh, our story for this first week was Jesus calling the first disciples. And we talked about how the first disciples were fishermen. Uh, so it was their job to fish all day and to catch fish and they would take care of their families. That was their business. Um, and, um, and so we talked about how when Jesus called those first disciples, that he really called them into a relationship with Jesus and with each other and with all the people that they would meet. So this month we are talking about uh, how we can be the church in the world, even though we're not meeting in the church building. And the same is true of Vacation Bible School. Even though uh, you all are doing Vacation Bible School in your homes, um, how can we be followers of Jesus um, out in the world? So um, I would like you to consider some ways that you can be a good example to others um, and the people that you know in your life, uh, whether it is writing cards and notes and doing video calls to the loved ones that, uh, that you're not able to see right now? Um, is it touching base with friends, sending notes to friends, uh, sending pictures to friends? Uh, maybe even some of your families are doing some social distance visits right now. Um, and, and not only that, um, not only the people that you know, but also how you treat the people you don't know. Um, so whether there's uh, you know, new people in your neighborhood or as you go through life and there's new kids at school, um, people that you just meet in passing, um, really how we can show God's love to everyone in the world is what we are talking about. And that's part of being church in our world. Let us pray. God, we thank you for giving us Jesus and the disciples. There is so much that we can learn from them. God, help us to be followers of Jesus and to show your love with everyone that we meet in the world. Amen. Good morning. Today's reading comes from the prophets. The prophets were people who held those in power accountable by speaking God's word, even if, when it was difficult. In today's text, the prophet Amos was critical of people substituting festivals and offerings for love and justice. Today, our reading comes from the prophet Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. Let us listen for a word from God. I hate, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. May God bless our hearing of this word. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. We have heard these words. They are familiar to us. We know these words from scripture. We know these words from the mouths of people like Martin Luther King Jr who called upon the example of the prophet Amos in his letter from Birmingham jail. And yet we often hear them in the same manner that we hear Micah 6, 8, which reads, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? With both of these texts, we hear them as aspirational. We hear them as goals we also hear them with warm, fuzzy feelings, but rarely do we pay attention to their context. 
And because both of these statements follow words about religious rituals, rituals in which the people were happy to engage even while remaining unchanged, even while refusing to see the needs of the world which required their attention, even too often while abusing the people around them. In the case of Amos, we see a prophet from the land of Judah, the southern kingdom of the people of Israel, and the prophet Amos was called to go to the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. This was a time when Israel was experiencing what the leaders would describe as peace and prosperity. It was a time when the nation of Israel was at its largest in terms of land acquisition. It was a time when they were able to turn a blind eye to the threat of Assyria because they looked at these other signs and chose to believe they were indications of God's favor. So it was into this scene that Amos arrived. And is off, as is often the case of true prophets, he was not welcome. He was not welcome because he refused to be a yes man to the king. He was not welcome because instead of a word of God's affirmation, he brought God's critique. He was not welcome because he asked the people of Israel to look with clear eyes at the whole situation. Because friends, as is often the case, a nation experiencing peace and prosperity does not mean it is well for everyone. A nation having great landmass or military might does not mean every citizen is experiencing justice and compassion. A nation being judged successful by earthly standards does not mean that it is seen as righteous in the eyes of God. But at this point in Israel's history, the leaders were so blinded by this vision of success they had painted that they forgot to see God clearly. In fact, while they were doing their rituals and making their offerings and going to worship as required, they were letting these acts replace the true call of their faith, the call to shape the world according to God's vision of justice and compassion, according to God's vision of equity and righteousness. And sometimes we aren't so different from them. Sometimes we allow our rituals to replace our commitment to righteousness. Sometimes we convince ourselves that as long as we show up at the appointed hour or give a generous offering or claim our faith in a public conversation, that we are exempt from the moral obligations of living from the heart of God. Sometimes we allow our title of Christian or person of faith to become all we need and let ourselves off the hook from doing the hard work of justice making. And this is justice, not in the way we tend to use that word culturally, as in a system that punishes people for their crimes, but the biblical commitment to justice is about fairness and equity and integrity. And so the prophet Amos, reminds not only the people of his time, but reminds us today that going through the motions of being people of faith is not enough. In fact, the language Amos uses on behalf of God, did you hear it? It's strong language. I hate, I despise, I will not accept, 
I will not look upon, I will not listen. In the text we read last week from Psalm 137, the people couldn't bring themselves to sing their songs in the land of exile. But in this week's text, long before the people experienced that exile, they are happy to sing their songs to God even while not living in God's ways, and Amos tells them that God is not listening. The language is strong because the content matters. The language is strong because the leaders, the power people, the haves of their society are replacing justice and care for others with self-centeredness and empty acts of worship. So what does this mean for us? Well, first, let's be clear what it doesn't mean. Especially in these days when we long to worship together, to share space, to see the faces of others from our community, to lift our voices together in song and in prayer, so we must name that Amos isn't saying that public worship doesn't matter. In fact, in these days when we have been separated, many of us have come to realize how important that act of community is. It isn't that pausing each week with intentionality to direct our attention to something bigger than ourselves to our creator and to the world around us and to our connection with our human family, it isn't that that is not important. In fact, it fuels much of how we live our lives. But the problem comes when we believe that's all there is. When we think that we can show up for worship and then live any way we want, then Amos speaks. When we live as if our offerings are a payoff to God with hopes that God will look the other way when we ignore the needs of the world, then Amos speaks. When we sing our songs of praise to God, but then make decisions about our living only thinking of ourselves, it is to this that Amos speaks. When we think we can give gifts to the church and in turn expect silence for our sins, Amos speaks. Amos doesn't say we can't or shouldn't worship or sing or share our offerings but Amos asks us to expand our view and to understand that our whole lives are worship. If we understand worship to be about communion with God and each other, about learning to live in the ways of God and opening ourselves to be shaped by God, then worship is not a service we attend or a way we spend an hour on Sundays, but worship becomes a way of life. And worship is real when we provide justice for the people we encounter. So how do we worship? Well, we gather together. These days we do that by Zoom or YouTube or Facebook and we sing and we pray and we listen and we share and we commit ourselves again to living in God's way. But that's not all. Because then we serve a meal to those who otherwise would not eat. And this too is worship. We march in the streets with and for those for whom the system is not working, because this too is worship. 
we write to our legislators and we demand that they make changes to make the systems more just because participation in the systems of our country is also worship. We listen to the stories of those who are different from us and we don't try to rewrite them because this is worship. Friends, three months ago when we went into quarantine, this global pandemic laid bare the realities of many injustices around us. We have watched as sick people have gone to work because they barely make a living wage and certainly don't have paid time off, but have children to feed and rent to pay. We have watched as people in poverty and people of color have died at higher rates from COVID-19 because of both ongoing care they don't have access to and crisis care they can't afford. We have watched as we have seen so many workers deemed essential in this time, but who fall into categories of least valued during normal circumstances. As all of this has become clear, we are reminded that our world is crying for justice. And in recent weeks, as people of all backgrounds and experiences have come together to fight for justice, for reform, for the shifting of systems within which we live that don't give people a real and fair chance, we are reminded that our world is crying for justice. Amos says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In the land of Israel, rivers and streams would have been dry much of the year. But when the wet season came, the water would have flowed with power. Picture it, water flowing down from the mountains, consuming everything in its path, filling up the rivers to overflowing. Now picture it, justice flowing freely and continually, reaching everyone who lives and breathes. This isn't seasonal justice. This isn't occasional justice. This isn't convenient justice. This isn't justice for the powerful and the privileged, for the Anglo and the rich. This, God's justice, is about justice continually and for all. May it be. We, as members and friends of First Christian Church Disciples of Christ, are a part of what we call a movement of wholeness in a fragmented world. I love that, in part because of our goal of being wholeness. But I also love the word movement. We are called to be moving in and among God's people in active ways. We are called to the mission of being the church in God's world. Another way we can support the mission of the church is by supporting the work that happens through the ministries of First Christian Church. In this time of virtual worship, financial gifts can still be made by mailing in your offering to the postal address on the screen or by clicking the donate button on the website. May we give generously. As we come to the communion table, I invite you to gather whatever food and drink you will receive for communion. Here at the table, it isn't the food and drink 
that make this place special. Rather, it is the one who invites us here, the one who welcomes us, the one who died working for a more just world. Let us pray together. God, as we prepare to eat and drink at this your table, bless these elements that in receiving them, our hearts and lives may be readied to be changed that we may live out your call to work for justice and righteousness. Amen. So we come to this table and we remember that Jesus shared a meal together with friends and there he took bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body. And I invite you now to eat of the bread and in doing so to offer your body for the work of God in this world. Likewise, after the meal, Jesus took a cup and he passed it to his friends and he said, this cup is a new covenant made in love. I invite you now to drink of the cup and in doing so to affirm your desire for the love of God to flow through you. We are not called to be bystanders in God's world. Rather, we are called to active, difficult work, to love, to heal, and to be the church. Let us work in ways that bring about the kingdom of God. Amen.